it is an incredible pleasure for me to introduce you to an environmental trailblazer, Kate Brandt. I met Kate three years ago when we were both speakers at a Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability uh, Summit. It was a really special, a special event, and I was blown away by Kate's intellect, by her thoughtfulness, and just her all-around ridiculous accomplishments. I hope that you'll feel the same way tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about Kate and how she got to where she is tonight. She started her professional sustainability journey in senior roles with the US federal government. She was a senior advisor at the Department of Energy, the director for energy and environment in the White House Office of Presidential Personnel, and the energy advisor to the Secretary of the Navy. During her time with the US Navy, Kate received the Distinguished Public Service Award, which is the highest award the US Navy can give to a civilian. And she received that for her work helping the Navy, which is often thought of as blue, go green. She then served as the nation's first federal chief of sustainability officer within the Obama administration, where she promoted sustainability across the federal government uh, and all of the operations, including hundreds of thousands of buildings. Think about how many federal buildings there are, folks lots of them, uh, as well as vehicles and a staggering $445 billion annually in purchased goods and services. So that's a lot of stuff to uh, think about from a sustainability lens. Today, Kate leads sustainability across Google's worldwide operations, products, and supply chain. She's that connective tissue, ensuring that the company is capitalizing on opportunities to strategically advance sustainability. Kate is an incredible global champion for sustaining life on our marvelous planet. And we are so grateful to have her as our colleague and our friend. Please join me in welcoming tonight's esteemed speaker, Kate Brandt. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for the wonderful introduction. And it has been such a pleasure getting to partner with you and your team here at the Academy. So thank you for having me. And thank you uh, to everyone for being here tonight. Um, I have to tell you, it is such an honor for me to have the chance to address you here in this planetarium. I, I am a local gal. I grew up uh, not far from here in Muir Beach, just north of the city. My mom and dad are actually here with us this evening. Uh, yes. <laughs> And you know, one of my favorite things to do as a kid, particularly on a foggy day, was to beg my mom and dad to take me here to the Cal Academy. And I remember wandering around the aquarium and playing with you know, the tide pools and touching the sea cucumbers. Um, but my favorite thing was coming to the planetarium. So it's really a dream come true to be here with you. And you know, when I, I wasn't here at the Cal Academy, you could often find me back in Muir Beach, uh, exploring the redwood trees, playing in the tide pools at the beach. And you know, during my time in this coastal ecosystem, I learned something. The animals, plants, and microbes that make up what we think of as nature are truly the consummate engineers of the world. They represent billions of years of research and development. And they have developed a system where waste, it just doesn't exist. So, you know, think about a tree. You know, it grows from the energy of the sun, the nutrients in the soil, and the water from the rain. And eventually that tree dies, you know, it falls. And then the enzymes, bacteria, and microbes in the forest, they break that tree down into new life. This is the genius of nature, the original circular economy. But what if we applied this same approach to our modern economy? What if everything was repurposed, reused, and reborn for use again? Well, at Google, we have been asking ourselves these questions for a long time. And you know, I've been with the company for almost four years now, and the thing that I find really special about getting to do this work is that sustainability has truly been a core value since our founding of two decades ago. And we truly strive to build sustainability into everything that we do. So that goes for our global fleet of data centers. We have 14 data centers around the world. They are designed, built, and operated to be as efficient as possible. It's also why we have a commitment to 100% renewable energy 
and it's made us the largest corporate purchasers of renewable energy in the world. It also goes for our offices. We have offices in over 160 cities around the world, and we're focused on green buildings. And it extends to our products. Uh, for example, we have recycled content plastic that goes into that Google Home, Chromecast, you may have them in your living room. Those have recycled content plastic. But I have to say, the area that I think is perhaps the most exciting and where we have such tremendous opportunity is in utilizing Google technology to enable everyone, businesses, individuals, policymakers, to drive positive impact and also to preserve some of our most special places. So what I wanted to do this evening, since we have this tremendous dome, is share with you a bit of a journey around some of the technology and the partners that we've worked with. And I thought, where better to begin than in the Galapagos? So this was essentially our making of for our tremendous project that brought us to the Galapagos. And my wonderful colleague, Karen Tuxen Bateman, who is actually here with us this evening, uh, she and her team, they went from Mountain View, from our, our hometown just south of here, and they flew over to the Galapagos. And what did they bring with them? They brought with them some of that cool and weird looking stuff that you saw in the video. You saw those backpacks with the weird circle on top. Those are the Trekker backpacks that enable us to capture 360 imagery on land. And then of course they brought their gear to go underwater. They captured what we call underwater street view. You know, we all know street view from, you know, seeing what it look, what San Francisco looks like from afar. But we also do underwater street view, and that is what you are looking at here. These incredible sea lions from the Galapagos. And so this project, I think, is such a special example of the way that we can utilize technology to transport anyone. You know, the Galapagos are a place that few of us will get to visit in person, but through this technology, anyone can transport themselves there and experience the unique flora and fauna of this incredible ecosystem that Darwin explored so many years ago. But of course, unfortunately, there are many places around the world that have not been preserved. There has not been the focus that we've had on the Galapagos in, in preserving those ecosystems. So we're also thinking about ways we can use our technology to preserve new habitat. And one of those is called Global Fishing Watch. This was a partnership between Google and two NGOs, Oceana and Sky Truth. And what we did here was not even technically feasible only a few years ago. But through the marriage of cloud computing, machine learning, and geomapping, we've been able to create this real-time heat map of global fishing activity. And basically what we did, to kind of oversimplify, is at any given time, there are all these different vessels out at sea, and they're pinging out their location through something called an automatic identification system. And we used a machine learning algorithm to say, okay, that's a fishing vessel as opposed to a tugboat or a tanker or anything else. And then also the algorithm learned what it actually looked like when the vessel was fishing. And that created this real-time heat map. And what policymakers and communities have been able to do is use this data to ensure fishing is happening where it should be and not where it shouldn't. And there are five new marine protected areas that have been created thanks to this tool. But then, a little bit closer to home, we have time lapse. So what you're looking at up here is Las Vegas is growing over the last 30 years on one side, and Lake Mead is shrinking on the other. 
So what time lapse is, is this was a Landsat data set that was literally locked in a vault underground. No one had access to this information. But our team at Google liberated it. They put it online. And now you can see these 30 years of change across the Earth's surface, surface anywhere in the world. So you can fly here to Las Vegas and see what you're looking at. You can fly anywhere in the world and see man-made islands emerge. You can see rivers and lakes recede. So it's an incredible tool for understanding the changes that have occurred on our planet over time. And then, even a little bit closer to home, we have Project Airview. So Project Airview was also, in fact, a project that was led by our wonderful colleague, Karen. And Airview has taken air quality sensors from a local company here called Acloma. And these are sensors that measure all different kinds of pollutants, NOx, SOx, particulate matter, and more. And on a few of our Street View cars, and you know, you've probably seen these cars driving around. This is how we create Google Maps. On a few of those cars, we've attached these air quality sensors in Oakland, down in LA, in Copenhagen, and in a few other cities so far. And what that does is it produces this heat map of air quality at a hyper-local level. So we can see on a street-by-street street and a neighborhood-by-neighborhood neighborhood basis, what is the air quality like in our communities? And as we know, it's often some of our most vulnerable communities where air quality is the poorest. And so this data is now enabling us to improve air quality and human health in some of our most vulnerable communities. And then, Coming even a little bit closer into our homes, and of course here to the Cal Academy, we have Your Plan, Your Planet. This was a partnership between our team and Elizabeth's team. And essentially what we wanted to do here was say, let's give people really easy, very science-based tips and tricks they can use in their everyday lives to be more sustainable. And as you may know, our three biggest impacts on the planet are energy, water, food waste, and then also how we use our stuff. And so that's really the basis for this tool. And in developing this, you know, I even learned some things. For example, did you know that the average American household uses about three Olympic swimming pools worth of water a year? And one of the easiest and frankly, you know, good, good for your life, good for your time management ways to reduce your water use is do not wash your dishes by hand. Put them in the dishwasher. You can save time, you can save water. Another one that I applied at my home recently is your hot water heater turns out to be a huge hog of energy. They're often set too high. Like mine was set up around 140. You turn it down to 120, you'll still get that nice hot shower, but you will save a lot of energy. And this year for Earth Day, we launched this new module about stuff. And this is really focused on what I was talking about at the beginning of my talk, the circular economy, how we keep our products and materials in use for longer. And you know, this is really important. Did you know that there is every second an entire garbage truck full of clothes goes in the landfill? So if we can change that, we can have a huge impact. So I thought it might be fun, since we just launched this a couple days ago, to ask you guys some of these questions and test your knowledge and give you something to take home with you. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to read the question. And then if you could please raise your hand if you'd like to give the answer. And then we'll see if you're right. All right, so first up, guess the number of pieces of clothing produced every year across the globe. Raise your hand, yes. Was that, what did you say, 100 billion? You are absolutely correct, sir. Very good, all right. And you know what, that equals 14 pieces of clothing for every person on the planet. All right, question number two. Guess the percentage of materials in clothing that are recycled into textiles and fiber. Anyone, anyone? One percent? You guys are good. <laughs> you are right. It is less than one percent, even though, of course, it is actually very easy to recycle these things. All right, you guys are on a roll. Question number three. Guess how much clothing production has increased in the last 15 years? 4X. All right, I'm afraid 4X is not correct. <laughs> Sorry. The correct answer is 2X. And this has resulted in people keeping their clothes about half as long as 15 years ago. All right, last one. 
Guess the global cost of clothes that are thrown out each year that could still be used. Four, 460? You guys are very good. Yes, you are correct. The answer is 460. And you know what? That is more than the GDP of Thailand. So I hope you've learned something. Clearly, some of you already knew the answers. Um, but definitely check out this tool. It's a really great thing to use at home. It's great for the family. It's at g.co slash yourplanyourplanet. And also, because we were hearing that people were enjoying using this with the kids, we've actually developed a companion curriculum for Your Plan Your Planet. So for our educators out there, check out the Google Teacher Center, and you can find the curriculum for Your Plan Your Planet as well. And then, of course, if you've gotten excited about thinking about how you can be more sustainable at home, there is another great tool that you can use to learn more about your local ecosystem, about the great plants and flora and fauna in your backyard or out on Mount Tam when you go for a hike. That's when I use this tool. And that is iNaturalist. Some of you, I'm sure, are already familiar with this. But this is yet another great collaboration between Google and the Cal Academy. And so what you're looking at on the dome right now is these are all of the observations that have been taken on iNaturalist just in the last day. This is about 30,000 observations. And you can see how global this community of users is. And so for those of you who haven't used iNat yet, definitely consider downloading it. You can uh, take your phone with you out on a hike, take a picture of that flower you think might be a poppy or that weird worm you see on the trail. And then you get a few things. First, you get some instant feedback on, hey, what is this thing? But also, you are contributing to science. You are contributing to this global database of information about the plants and animals that are in our backyard. So in closing, I just wanted to share a few thoughts. I, I think, I'm sure for many of us in this room, some of the recent information that we have been hearing about the speed of change in our planet is depressing. It's terrible. It's really hard to hear that we have a little over a decade to make a drastic economy-wide shift or we will have irrever irreversibly impacted our climate. But I have to say the thing that gives me a tremendous amount of hope is what we've been talking about tonight, the huge role that technology can play in unlocking new data and empowering everyone to take action and also in preserving our special places like the Galapagos. So thank you so much, and I would love to take some of your questions. And I know we'll have mics coming around. So whatever you guys want to talk about. Please. That might be I'm good one for you. <laughs> I can repeat the questions. So sure, and also and this is a good academy question. Oh, I just got put up on the stage again. Hi. Yeah, hello. Um, the question was, um, it would be great if the academy could put some of this information up on the website so that people would know more about it. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, we actually, iNaturalist has its own site, and um, that's a great suggestion to actually have maybe some part of our scrolling homepage or another landing page. We do have an iNaturalist landing page within the site, but... In all honesty, a lot of things get buried um, within the website, so being able to surface some of this great work is a fabulous idea. Oh, perfect. For the teachers, absolutely. I think More we need to teachers. put, we need to cross-link your plan, your planet, yes. for sure. Uh, let's do some linking. That is such a great suggestion. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Questions? Yes, right here. I can repeat the question, too, if necessary. Is Google doing anything with all of your partners and your customers to share this information and encourage them to use these tools? So as part of your own supply chain, are you incorporating this to drive that further? Yeah, absolutely. We are always working to raise awareness about this work. So we ha if you want to learn about these tools and many more, we have a website called sustainability.google, and we have a tools page where we've shared all of our various tools. 
And, and as you point out, m all of this work really has been done with partners. So that's where it's been really critical for us to not only raise awareness through our platforms, but also through our partners. And I should have mentioned, actually, the Galapagos project that we looked at was in partnership with the Charles Darwin Foundation, who's here with us this evening. Um, but absolutely, we are eager to get the word out uh, about the tools. So please help us with that, too. Yes, up here. I've been fascinated by your work in the San Francisco Bay. Uh, with the Google boats uh, on the end on climate change on on the San, around the San Francisco Bay, and I wondered if you could talk about it at all. Yeah, so we have had the, a project sort of similar to what we talked about with the Galapagos, where we have used um, the the tracker to get imagery of the bay out at sea, which um, which is is a great resource to be able to see some of that change over time. And also, we recently um, co-founded a group uh, called the Bay Area Climate Resilience Council, where we've come together with other local businesses like um, Genentech and Facebook and several others to create a space where local businesses can come together and engage with policymakers, can engage with the community about how do we collectively solve these climate resilience challenges that we're facing. Of course, sea level rise, the challenges with wildfire, et cetera. So we really wanted to create a space where the private sector in the Bay Area could come together on that regional scale. So we've just begun that work, but we feel like it's going to become a great forum for us. Other questions? And I may not be able to see all of you. Yes, right here in the middle. Why don't you just shout and I'll, I'll repeat. What are some of ideas that come that have come up that we haven't implemented yet? Oh well, lots because I think you know we're so lucky in that we have so much commitment to this work. But it's always sort of what do we do first? Where do we prioritize? The thing that I'm really excited about right now is continuing to incorporate more sustainability data into our products. Um, so of course, you know Google Maps is already a great tool for sustainability. You may have seen just this week we launched new data for EV charging, and it shows you if the EV charger is actually available yet. So that's a great example of what we're already doing. But I would love to see us do a lot more. You know, for example, we now have the Google Assistant. You know, okay, Google, could, what if the Google Assistant could tell you really great information about what's recyclable or about other things you can do in your home to be more sustainable? So those are the kinds of things that we are working on that I think could have a huge impact. All right, anybody else? All right, Let's wonderful. give Kate one more round of Thank applause. Thank you very much. Thanks.